thanks for attending. And uh, I know you could attend any other uh, talk at this point that's available. So I appreciate you attending here. And it's, and it's uh, great to know that there are folks who are interested in domain-driven design. Although I'll have to say uh, I will touch on DDD, but this talk is not you know, a, a DDD-centric talk. It's, it's, uh, it does talk about domain-driven design techniques, but um, it's really about rethinking legacy and monolithic software and how to approach that, okay? And for, for any who weren't here before, I have a couple books and t-shirts to give away if you have a, a, um, <clears throat> a question, walk up to the microphone afterwards and you'll get something, <laughs> whatever's available. And uh, so to start off with, I just wanna say, notice the, the word thinking. And um, you know, uh, one person was no, notorious about making statements about thinking. Um, Bernard Shaw, right, the, uh, he, um, he said, you know, some people, most people think only once or twice a year. He said, I've made a, an international name for myself by thinking once or twice a week. Um, you know, there, there's some serious thought that really needs to go into software development. And so I just want to emphasize the word thinking in rethinking because this really is about thinking. And I think that, I believe that domain-driven design is about thinking, it's about learning, it's about discovery. So this goes hand in glove with uh, domain-driven design. There's something I wanna get away, uh, get over with right away, um, this. Everybody is thinking microservices, right? Everybody wants to go microservices. Um, and notice that I've actually rendered like three different kind of you know, sizes for microservices. What is a microservice anyway? And what size should your microservices be? Um, so if everybody wants to do that, then, right, we should want to do that. <laughs> um, how many here are here because they're either exploring or, or already engaged in a microservices effort? Yeah, so pretty typical because, um, when I engage with companies, whether I'm, I'm training, whether I'm consulting, it's always the same story. People are stuck in the mud. They can't deliver. I just tweeted about the, uh, the, the US Air Force uh, presentation, and I wanna say this, this has nothing to do with the military statement. I, I am not pro-military, but I will say that um, uh, to see this happening, where they've gone from multi-year release um, to you know daily releases 30 times per month and I see commercial companies right fortune companies global 2000 companies who release once or twice a year because they're stuck in the mud so I think it's important to to really consider this now what does the business ultimately want it's pretty clear, right? But now what you're thinking is, yeah, but I need to convince them that what they really want is this. <laughs> you know? I mean, is that right? Yeah, of course, come on. So let's, ha let's do some definitions here. Definitions about what I'm going to talk about. You know, what, what is legacy software? What is a microservice? So let's start off there. And I have to say, this is legacy, okay? Legacy makes money. If legacy didn't make money, it wouldn't be legacy. It would have been unplugged, right? So um, here's a dilemma that we face. The legacy is messy but it makes money. Are you gonna be responsible for disconnecting the legacy uh, without providing an equivalent money generator? Um, I don't wanna be responsible for that. 
So what do we do about that? Well, you know, the word monolith comes up a lot, and there's sort of become this, this battle between, you know, monolith and microservice, right? I just want to say that you could do much worse than developing a monolith. This is a monolith. It is a well-modularized monolith. And, okay, we got some God objects going on there. We have maybe some undesirable, uh, you know, dependencies even between entities or some kinds of services in this monolith. But also notice that the, the interactions between the modules in the monolith have well-defined interfaces. And you're not paying the penalty of the network. You know, disconnections, uncertainty of when will things finish, what, you know, what's happening. When you go to microservices, a true distributed architecture, uh, event-driven, message-driven, you are going to have to deal with the network and all the things that can go wrong with the network. Now, this is how you can do much worse, right? BBOM is big ball of mud. Now, this is where most people are, okay? Most organizations, fortune companies, global, 2000, and so forth, they are mostly experiencing this. Even companies that are technology companies that have made their fortunes on technology have gradually moved into this state. And maybe it even started out as a nicely modular, you know, nice modular uh, monolith. But over the years, the changes in, um, you know, customer demand for features, functionality, and also the technology changes that have sort of left that old code behind have rendered this. And you have two situations that I've seen, that I've experienced. The developers don't want to deal with this anymore. They want out of it. They're demoralized by it. Or the opposite extreme, they defend it because it's their job. <laughs> you know? Wow, that's a difficult dilemma. And you know what? I think that most of these things, uh, you know, that, that we call systems are in this situation because they've started out with this kind of life, an anemic domain model. And I want to show you what I mean by anemic domain model. This is a, a client domain object, or is it? Well, it's a client row in a database, that's for sure, because it's annotated as an entity, with an ID and a bunch of columns. And notice that there's nothing here that tells you the intent of why you would change this object because you're simply going to use a public setter to set some data on this object. And whatever data you set has a meaning, but there's no expression to the meaning. There's nothing obvious that says, this is why I am setting the data. Instead of having a meaningful, fluent behavior that causes the properties or the attributes to get set, instead, what we do is just put that responsibility on the client to understand why the data is set. Now, it may take you a few hours or a, a few days to figure out why data is set on this object and other objects. And okay, I'm showing you a very simplistic object, but when the objects get complex, it's a completely different story. And complexity is where you really need to focus on fluent behaviors that cause the setting of attributes. Otherwise, it's tribal knowledge that is eventually lost as the generations of, of the system are, you know, are sort of covered over by, let's say, the kudzu, right? Of, here in the south, they know about kudzu. It's a, it's a vine that 
that shades other plants and it grows like very quickly. And believe it or not, like a century ago, people were paid $8 an hour to, to sow, um, to, to seed, plant kudzu by the acre, $8 per acre. And now, you know, it's like taking over land at various rates. Some, some say more than 100,000 acres per year in the United, southern United States and, and even going into the north. I think that, that this kind of software is the kudzu. And we talk about vines, right? Straggler, strangler vines to fix this. Well, we also have the same kind of vine uh, or, or a similar vine that, that just chokes out the daylight into understanding a monolith, um, be, you know, sort of like the kudzu does. So what is a microservice anyway? Some people say it's 100 lines of code. Who here has heard that? That's all? Wow. Uh, actually, the person who takes credit for naming microservices and creating the idea of microservices, this is his definition, 100 lines of code. Um, some people have said, no, no, it's not 100, it's 400. <laughs> uh, some people have said, no, it's 1,000, you know. You know what I think? I think that naming, numbering any size of a microservice as in, this is good if it's 100 lines of code, it's bad, what, if it's 125 lines, is that a bad microservice, 200? Um, I mean, shouldn't it be sort of business driven, you know? So, here's, here's a situation that we have with the uh, 100 line of code microservice. And uh, we start deploying them, 100, you know, like, I mean, think of just each of these as roughly an entity. That could be less than that, could be a function or a method, right? And so we start out with dozens of these things, and we have a central message bus with topics where we're publishing, you know, messages, may, maybe events, hopefully events, about what has happened on each of those, and then the other entities that are, that are interested in that are informed this is all distributed, this, this is 100 lines of code everywhere. And then, you know, we're pretty happy with where we've gotten. We have dozens of these things. And then we start thinking, hmm, what's still relevant a month later, right? Um, do I have a dependency on a microservice or am I, do I have dependencies on me and can I be unplugged, right? Can I literally shut down this microservice? Because we think it's no longer relevant, but is somebody still consuming my events or am I providing some service that maybe I'm not aware of? And you know what has happened with this? The very person who takes credit for microservices and says microservices should be 100 lines of code actually advises this. They're like, okay, we can't figure out that problem, so what we're gonna do is not unplug anything because it only requires about $400 a month to keep all the microservices running, each microservice, right? Now, I don't know what kinds of companies that this consultant works with, but you know, when it starts getting like this, and then really what we're saying is it's getting like this. And then we say, okay, in a complex system, how many lines of code are there anyway? Two million lines of code? Well, let's just take two million. Maybe we'll check five million. I mean, I don't know what kinds of systems you work on, but two million lines of code, that's 20,000 20, microservices. At $400 a month is $8 million a month to run those 20,000 microservices, which is $96 million a year. Uh, let's say it's 5 million lines of code. You know, do the same calculations, $240 million a year. Now, I don't know about you, but my thought is, it, you know, it reminds me of when we would eat out, and when I was a kid, we would eat out, you know, and, and, and someone would accidentally drop a plate in the kitchen or busting a table, and they would drop a plate and push, and my mother would always say, there go the profits. <laughs> I mean, how many of you would get fired over that? I, I think pretty much all of us would. Now, I may be off by, let's say I'm off by, by half. Okay, 
would would 120 million dollars a year save your job in, in cost to you know keep these things running so okay here comes the ddd part bounded context as a microservice well i'm not the only one saying this sam newman in his book building microservices if, if you're interested in microservices you've probably read sam's book and sam says bounded context you know is a good size of a microservice. What is the size of a bounded context? It's the size of the ubiquitous language. And when we're careful about dividing up the, the models by language, linguistic drivers, where within a context we have a very definite definition of the meaning of a concept and behaviors that it, that, that and any other concepts have, they tend to be quite small. But if you notice here, the, the bounded context roughly represents a portion of the entities of those 100 lines of code microservices. So we can put some of those together, and when we recognize that microservice is less about lines of code and more about a deployment strategy, then deploying several entity types together is probably a good idea to avoid the server sprawl. And I'll give you some more information on that later. So we want to identify the strategic drivers. And notice that I saw this tweet, I think it was based on a, a, um, a presentation, uh, a conference talk. But basically what the talk was saying is, look, we, we, we implement ordinary business process, but we stop short of strategic advantage. And I think that's another problem in our industry. So how do we avoid the anemic domain model? Simply tell the object what you want it to do. That is what objects were meant to do in the first place. They weren't meant to represent rows in a table. They were meant to, to encapsulate data and provide behavior that would mutate that data as needed. And trust me, when you do this, there are far less lines of code in a fluent model. You can actually test it with just a few tests. Try to test that anemic model. You could probably write 100 tests and still not be certain that those tests cover every kind of way that a client could set data on you. Yeah? And notice, too, we're emitting a domain event out of it. So downstream subsystems that we're engaged with that, that are dependent on us can know about this. And then notice that monolith, that's such a bad thing these days. Well, a modular monolith can actually represent bounded context within the single deployable unit, and you have lightweight integration between it. What do you get out of that? Well, you get the opportunity to go from monolith to microservice when it makes sense. When does it make sense? OK, maybe scale and performance is a thing in your area, but where I see the most need to go to my microservices is when one or more of those uh, modules or bounded contexts in the monolith has a greater rate of change than the others. And, and basically, you have to bring that monolith down and, and, and deploy and restart it, you know, sort of the old-fashioned way, instead of just deploying that microservice as a bounded context any time that you need to, and the other ones, or, or maybe most of them, tend to stay, you know, more, you know, static. Now, the question is, how do you get from here to here, right? That's, that's really the hard part. And I'm going to tell you, I, I, you know, I'm not going to try to, um, you know, bamboozle you in any way. I've done this, it's hard. It's, it's difficult, okay? And I think one of the best excuses for going, you know, um, from an old technology and rewriting, even though I put it in red because that's like danger Will Robinson, right? Um, you know, okay, COBOL, you can't hire COBOL programmers anymore. Companies that are still dependent on COBOL are trying to bring COBOL developers out of retirement, paying them a lot of money to keep this stuff running, right? 
So you can do this. You can eat an elephant. Um, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So this is change-driven, value-driven, test-driven, right? Basically what you are going to do is when the business says we need a new feature or there's a bug, you're going to go in and add value to the monolith and at the same time you're going to add tests and you're going to clean some stuff up. This is no different than Agile does anyway because we are constantly cleaning up even the well-modularized monolith and even the microservices. So clean up your code, reach this point, and then getting there is going to be doable. But there is a bit of a long haul to it. And I also caution, I, I heard Ron Jeffries caution this before, don't take a, a spike and try to do that all in one step because the business won't be happy with you and you're probably not going to succeed anyway, right? So do it as you add value. Of course, there's the strangler pattern, and, no, and I have done this. It's hard, okay, but it works. Um, when the monolith updates the database or creates something or deletes something, we generate using triggers, we generate a domain event out of that that we then start strangling with a single microservice and we strangle um, you know, one microservice at a time by, by seeing the event, reacting to the event, to the event in the microservice, and then we have to publish events back as users make changes to this. We have to publish events back because some users, most of the users, are still dependent on the monolith. So the changes that we make here, even in a brand new model, need to be reflected back into the monolith until we can strangle enough of it to start pointing most of the users over to microservices. And then you have to remember oh, we don't want to fire a trigger because that was an event from the other microservice that already knows this. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you'll see one of the most interesting stack overflows you've ever seen. So, um, yeah. There's a tool called Debezium, open source. I believe that Spring, uh, as in Pivotal, is involved in this. Red Hat is involved with it. And Oracle Golden Gate is another one for if you're not using an open source database that Debezium uh, has and basically what this is, it's a it's a database commit log tail um, uh, service that takes you know new transactions that are committed, but uh, and and gives you the opportunity to generate events. That's a little cleaner than having to deal with triggers. Um, restructuring. This is where you're going to use something like Debezium or Golden Gate to generate a query model. So this is CQRS, generate a query model off of the command model. Well, that means you're going to have to split models and the, and the legacy model is going to become, you know, write only, okay, write only. And your user queries will be based on a read model. This is also difficult, but you're going to take the hit probably mostly in the UI in this case. Yes, you'll have to do some, some rework and, and so forth, but you're not, you're not changing anything drastically. You're simply saying we have a query model, but it's not consistent with the command model, and so you're going to have to figure out a way like with server sent events or, or web sockets to get the, the um, UI updated just in time. And then there are variations on that. So as we strangle, right, then, then as we have this query model and, and the legacy has provided this, we can now start creating microservices even more efficiently because now we understand, we're not guessing, well, what entities or what table rows are involved in this transaction we now understand it and it gives you a better opportunity to take steps, okay? All right, so, um, you know, I was gonna tell you a little bit more about the efficiencies around this, but it looks like I need to leave a few minutes for time um, or for uh, questions, but Dave Farley, you know, recently was in this conversation about, you know, um, efficiency and he, he he raised some really interesting points, and this is my open source project, Vlingo, and uh, I was sort of chiming in with, with Dave Farley saying, um, 
true and, and, you know, even Donald Knuth said, if you don't understand the hardware architecture that you're running on, you're going to produce software that's pretty weird. And today, cores matter, right? What, what we want is cores to, to help us and to reduce this. And it can even become a moral situation. Now, I think businesses consider this more of a... Um, more of a money matter, right? So if you can reduce 100 nodes to seven nodes, they, they're all ears, right? Yeah, we want that. But there, there's even maybe a moral aspect to it. So there is some reactive rework that can be done and you know, reaching the reactive state. So if, if you wanna know more about that subject where everything is async, um, you might wanna take a look at the Vlingo project. Um, any questions? I have a few minutes, and first up. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead, go ahead please. Uh, a lot of the, the, the bias in technology in, 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 in uh, either in seminars or in books is very much on the technology, what technology should we use. Yep. Yes, you know, people do touch on the binded context, but they don't actually explain the, or, or uh, demonstrate the importance of identifying your aggregates, relationships, your public interfaces, your, your state machine. Do you think that the industry should focus more on what the binder context actually means yeah. for microservice that, uh, developers? That is what DDD is all about. It is business driven. Domain means business, right? It, domain doesn't mean dot com, you know, it means business and which book do you want it yes we have to be business focused you, you get a book which one the red one, the red one. okay <laughs> <laughs> okay good go ahead please yes absolutely business driven hi uh, my question is that uh, currently we struggle to get product managers to define their epics uh, down at the feature level and and kind of create the um, user stories in a way that can be executed within the sprint, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if a development team is um, using microservices as their strategy, um, what can a development team or an agile coach do to help coach product managers on thinking in a way that makes that planning and backlog grooming process much more efficient because we end yeah. up wasting a lot of time there. Yeah, so uh, what I emphasize is, is um, like taking a BDD approach, so behavior-driven behavior development. Um, I mean, in tooling that, that relates roughly to Cucumber or something like that. But um, um, so what you want to focus on is scenarios you can also use some techniques like uh, what's called impact mapping. This is where you actually involve the business in saying what impacts do we need to make to, to reach a goal and what actors, as in human actors, right, or, or machine actors are involved in, in doing this, in, in making this goal happen that we have to make impacts on. And then there's event storming, which is, uh, uh, invented by my friend Alberto Brandolini, but that I use in my workshops. So, um, and I talk about this here, and this is your, this is your book. And I talk about all those subjects here. Impact mapping, yeah. Okay, yep, okay. Yes, go ahead. What, what's the um, right number of microservices or the kind of sweet spot for a team to maintain, in your opinion? I mean, whatever you can handle, but, but I will say this. A microservice, as in a bounded context, belongs to a team, one team. If you, if you allow the, the bounded context to be worked on by multiple teams, the language will take on different meaning and get fractured, basically, right? So, so I can't say how many. It depends on the complexity, the rate of change of a bounded context. Um, you know, may, maybe, maybe you can take on a core domain and some supporting and generic domains, right, at, at the same time, so you're sort of focused on the core, which is probably going to change often, but the supporting and generic domains won't, or subdomains won't, okay? So come up and get a t-shirt, 
And I have one more t-shirt. Is there one more question? Uh, and I can give away the last t-shirt. Or somebody just say, I really want a t-shirt. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for attending, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So now our domain that's broken out, every request sometimes gets multiple domains to get it. Yeah. How do they adequately prioritize what might concern their own domain and all these domains? Yeah, well, I mean, it's difficult for me to say, right, oh, you need to do this. But what I would say is, what if you're actually discovering new bounded contexts, right? Maybe it's a different language. And ask yourself, do the changes that are being requested align with the language of the other bounded context, or are we force fitting them into that bounded context? If you're force fitting them, it probably means a different language, which means a different bounded context. And the other question is, are these one-off features or are they core like you know competitive advantage features because if they're competitive advantage it could be not only a new bounded context but a new core domain and that you really want to focus effort on on you know dealing with the complexity wrangling with the complexity and solving it in a in a single place or you know as much as it applies to that language i probably need to get off the stage now but thanks for your question thank you